Hi everyone, Mrs. Hansen once again, back with chapter 21's lesson. Lesson number two is picking up with section four, a section known as peptides. And we're on uh, the notepad page as well, kind of starting up in 21.4, it looks like about page seven. Peptides. We know that peptides and proteins are formed when amino acids are joined together by amide bonds. Let's take a look at a dipeptide that has two amino acids joined together. We will learn that we have an N-terminal amino acid always written on the left side. And we know that because the L uh, enantiomer is always the one in nature, L standing for left side. Not really, it means levo, but that's helping me remember why the nitrogen is placed on the left side. We know that this would be the chiral carbon. It's attached to four unique attachments. Uh, assuming that this is R1, it's not just another hydrogen like glycine, but any other of the 20 amino acids would have a chiral carbon. And then of course the carbonyl group at the other end. And so we'll learn that this is known as the carbon terminal amino acid. We'll learn that in the next coming slides. The amide bond highlighted in red here is attaching one amino acid to the next. And just very specifically, when we practice drawing here in a few moments, you'll see that the dipeptide bond, the dipeptide, it's being held together by what we refer to as a peptide bond that attaches the carbonyl carbon from one amino acid to the nitrogen group on the second amino acid. So on first amino acid, the peptide bond right here is attaching the carbonyl carbon from the first amino acid to the nitrogen group on the second amino acid. And as the chain propagates and becomes longer and longer and longer, we have many, many, many peptide bonds holding long chains of amino acids together. So peptides are joined amino acids. We could have a dipeptide, which is the adjacent, uh, you know, the bonding of two amino acids together. And in your notes, you've drawn just a nice General structure is what you see here of a dipeptide, and you've highlighted, somehow indicated where that peptide bond is, also known as the amide bond. The amide bond, because we remember the functional group of an amide is a carbonyl carbon adjacent to a nitrogen group, which of course this meets that criteria. This right here is an amide, but if we're specifically hooking together amino acids, you'll often hear it referred to as a peptide bond. So two amino acids make a dipeptide, and you guessed it, three amino acids would give you a tripeptide. So here a tripeptide with three amino acids joined together. Now notice we would take two amide bonds, two peptide bonds, to join together three amino acids. We will learn that this amino acid to the far left is called the N-terminal amino acid. And we will learn that the amino acid far to the right is the C-terminal carbon, carbon terminal amino acid. Now since this is made of three amino acids, here's the first, here would be the second, and of course here would be the third amino acid. And the identity of those amino acids is coming from whatever the R group is. And you remember, as I hope you are practicing as you go through your notes here, as you practice your amino acids, you're trying to memorize best you can these three letter and one letter codes to help you remember the structure and code for each one of those amino acids. So that's what I'm referring to as the R group. Whatever the R group is, you're going to be given the identity of the amino acid. All right, so tripeptides with three amino acids joined together. Of course, polypeptides would have many, many amino acids together. 
And by the time you get to 40 or more, you have a full-blown protein, right? So amino acids come together to form peptides. If we have two amino acids, it's a dipeptide. Three amino acids, a tripeptide. You could have polypeptides, which would be more than three, but less than 40. And by the time we start joining together extremely long chains of amino acids, we come up with full-blown protein molecules. Shut that phone down. All right, so to form a peptide bond, the amino acids are going to join together and remove a water molecule. This is called a dehydration process to remove water. And I'd like to go through this step by step with you in your notepad. Let's form a dipeptide and I want you to place on the left side the poly or the uh, amino acid, sorry, the amino acid ALA. Now, how are you doing with that? What I'm referring to is how are you doing memorizing the name of the amino acid from its three letter code? So for example, ALA. I'm learning to remember that ALA represents an alanine, alanine and its functional group is CH3. And so when I come back here, I can see the functional group of CH3 giving it its identity of ALA. Now I'm not asking you to memorize the structures. I'm asking you to know the three letter codes on one letter code for each of those amino acids so that if you're asked to draw ALA, S-E-R, you would know what these stand for so that you could go to your amino acid chart and find them. ALA, oh that's alanine. It has a functional group here of CH3. And serine, it has a functional group of CH2OH. So that's the part we need to know is what functional group with those three letter and one letter codes. And that's how I know that these functional groups are serine and alanine. Now it really matters what order you place them in. My analogy has always been, we have 26 letters in the alphabet and I wanna write a word. Those words matter in the order in which I place the letters. I don't get to place the letters any old which way and come up with a specific word. The same is true for a protein. I don't get to just place those amino acids in any old order because the order will be very specific for a protein just as letters build certain words, the order of amino acids builds certain proteins. So if I'm going to be asked to build ALA, S-E-R, it's important that the left side is the nitrogen, the N-terminal amino acid. It's written first. And that if I'm only building a diprotein, those one more amino acid to place, this will be the C-terminal amino acid. It will be written last. The order matters. Now, you've put together ALA. Notice that it is a salt at this point. In other words, we have the protonated amine, NH3+, and we have the COO negative that this is what we call the Zwitter ion a moment ago in our previous lesson. So I have the Zwitter ion for LA, ALA on the left, and I have the Zwitter ion for SER sitting next to it. And I want to join them together to make a dipeptide. To do so, we're going to remove a water molecule. The oxide here from the carboxylic acid, COO negative, and two of the three hydrogens get removed. These together combine to make the water molecule that's removed. To dehydrate means to split out water. And the way we do that, we take the O negative from the N terminal amino acid, this guy, and we remove two of the three hydrogens on the nitrogen 
from the C-terminal amino acid and we join together the nitrogen and the carboxylic acid carbon to create a peptide bond. So right when I look at this, what I have highlighted in pink is the ALA amino acid, alanine. Over here, what I have highlighted in green is the amino acid called serine. And when you join those together, you'll see a, a line, a bond, holding those three letter codes together. And that's telling you that the ALA written first is the N-terminal amino acid. It has a peptide bond attaching it to the next amino acid called serine, S-E-R. And it now is called the carbon terminal acid because it's written on the right. And when we split out a water, we created a peptide bond. Now notice that we can combine those two amino acids in the opposite order. We can place the SER first, followed by ALA. Absolutely, the, A, uh, the SER serine can be the N terminal amino acid. And we could have ALA written as the carbon terminal amino acid. That's absolutely fine. Just know that they are not the same. They are actually constitutional isomers. That the molecule dipeptide known as ALASER is a constitutional isomer to the dipeptide SERALA. They are not the same, but they are indeed isomers. And so you can, again, let's emphasize how we create the peptide bond. Notice the O negative from the N terminal amino acid and two of the three hydrogens from the C terminal amino acids amine group create the water molecule that's then split out, right? The H2O forms by removal of HOH. So here the oxide from the carbonyl group gets removed and two of the hydrogens on the amine get removed to create a site of attachment where the carbonyl carbon is now attached to the amine group with a new amide bond. This is still known as a dipeptide, whoops, dipeptide, because there's two amino acids joined together by a peptide bond known as the amide bond. The order matters, doesn't it? <clears throat> the amino acid with the free amino group is what we refer to as the N terminal amino acid. It's always written on the left. And the COO negative, the free group of COO negative is always, always written on the right. The N terminal amino acid places the nitrogen to the far left. And the C terminal amino acid places its Ku group, COOH there, is always on the right. And so two constitutional isomers, they are not the same, but they are isomers. As we had written on the last slide, the order matters. ALA, SER, ALA is the nitrogen terminal amino acid. And of course, SER would be the carbon terminal amino acid. The order matters. Here you have serine now as the nitrogen and alanine now as the carbon terminal amino acid. Those are constitutional isomers of one another. They are not the same. Well, let's take a look at this practice in your note pack here. It asks us to label the nitrogen terminal and the carbon terminal amino acids in each peptide. Well, first let's highlight so we can clearly see it, the peptide bond. What I've just highlighted separates one amino acid to the next. And so here I have an amino acid that's written on the left side. I'm just highlighting the entire structure in yellow and I can make this like one big box so you can see this is all one big amino acid. 
So this, because it's written on the left, would be known as the N-terminal amino acid. Let's abbreviate or we'll highlight in, uh, how about pink? The second amino acid, just trying to get all of that shaded in. There is a second amino acid here, and because it's written on the right, we would call it the C, or carbon terminal amino acid. Go into your chart, and I want you to tell me the identity of these amino acids. You don't have to memorize them, but you do have to know how to look them up. How do I identify what the name of the N-terminal amino acid is? How do I identify who the C-terminal amino acid is by name? Name them. Remember, the name comes from the functional group. So you have to go into your chart and find the functional group. For the first one, you have a CH2 attached to a CH2 attached to an S and then a CH3. So those are your order of bonding there. And then for your second amino acid, you have a CH2 bonded to a CH, CH3 taken twice. I'm asking you to use your chart. Remember, this is a test-taking tool page. Find those functional groups, scan those choices, and identify them by name. Pause the video, give yourself time to think, and then come back to me when you're ready to check. Pause, work it out, come back. Well, how did you do? Did you find the names of those amino acid groups? I bet you did. I saw the sulfur in the functional group, and that helps me to go quickly to find all of the choices that have sulfur in them. The name of that amino acid is methionine. The name of the carbon terminal acid was leucine, methionine and leucine. Now, what would you be expected to remember from that? What are the three letter codes for methionine and leucine? Well, leucine I can see is L-E-U, L-E-U. What about methionine? Did you find that? Methionine was M-E-T, M-E-T-L-E-U. And so here, M-E-T, L-E-U, that would be how we would write this dipeptide using our three letter codes. And this of course would represent the peptide bond, also called the amide bond, between the two adjoining amino acids. Cool, do it again. Identify the N-terminal amino acid the C-terminal amino acid, and then write the three-letter codes for this molecule. Pause, come back when ready. Work it out. Okay, are you ready? You ready to check? Well, let's see how you did. In the first, you found that I highlighted in yellow as the N-terminal amino acid. It's on the left side where the N, the amine group, is left as a charged functional group. And what I have labeled in pink would be the C-terminal amino acid. It's to the far right, and you can see the CuCoO negative. Since there are three amino acids in this structure, do you see that? There's, I tell that by looking at how many C double bond O's I can find, and that's helping me see that this is actually a tripeptide. You have phenylalanine, which is this functional group. You have alan, alanine, aniline, sorry, which is this functional group, and the last one was glutamine, glutamine, which was the carbon terminal amino acid. Now, how did you go about writing those three-letter codes? Did you find them? What is the code for phenylalanine? 
What did you find for the code? Let me pause and give you time if you hadn't come up. Find those three letter codes. When looking for those, clo those uh, codes, those three letter codes, you're just going back into this chart provided for you in your notepad, working to help you remember those three letter codes. And so when asked to put the code together for this tripeptide, you found phenylaniline to be P-H-E. It's hooked together with a bond, a peptide bond, to aniline, which would be written as A-L-A, -A, bonded to glutamine, which has G-L-N as its three-letter code. So a couple of ways you'll have this asked of you. You could be provided the three-letter codes and asked to draw the tripeptide, or you could be given the structures of the tripeptide and asked to write the three-letter code. That's the important part of utilizing uh, when, you're, when you're working to memorize. I'm not asking you to memorize the structures. I'm just asking you to be able to look at this structure. You'll be given its name, but I want you to be able to find and then, you know, based on that name, tell me what its code is. All right, so that's just flashcards. I really think that would be helpful. So let's practice drawing a dipeptide from two amino acids. And we're going to draw valine as the N terminal and glycine as the, um, on the right. So it's the carbon terminal chain. So here we have step one. I want you to draw the structure of the individual amino acids from left to right. So that means if I want to draw valine on the left, I've got to go and find what is R for valine. And I'm going to put in glycine on the right. So tell me what is the functional group for glycine on the right. And I don't have you memorize those functional groups, but you have to be able to find them. Valine and glycine. Well, glycine, if you recall, is the simplest of all amino acids. It has just a hydrogen uh, as its terminal N. And glycine has a, that's the simplest one. And the other one we're drawing is valine, V-A-L. And so when I find valine, you can see it has a CH, CH3 taken twice. That's your valine. So we found glycine. When I look at that, you can see the R group is simply a hydrogen. And we also needed to know valine, and that was CH, CH3 taken twice. So with those looked up, we're ready to draw those structures. Take a moment, pause the video, and draw valine on the left, and just place glycine on the right. All right, so here's what your page looks like right now. You have V-A-L, valine. And then sitting next to it is glycine. Notice we're not attaching them, but I just wanted to emphasize we're adding them. We're going to do this step by step. Step one, simply place these two groups next together. Now on the N terminal, the N terminal means that the nitrogen group is not attached. So this is the N terminal amino acid. It will have its NH3 plus group still remaining intact. And notice that the glycine now is going to be called the C-terminal amino acid, meaning that it's going to have its COOH, COO group on attached. It's going to be a negative. So this is the two parts that we want to have next to each other. The VAL, valine, has a COO to the right side. The glycine, the NH3 group to the left side. This is where we're about to form, about to form, the peptide bond. Alrighty. So step two, let's join together the adjacent COO negative and NH3 plus groups. So what I'm about to do is ask you to draw this structure and I'm just asking you to highlight this arrow. So draw this with me again. This is where it says step two. I'd like you to redraw NH3 plus CH lead down to your R, which is CH, CH3 taken twice, and the C double bond O, O negative. And this is what I'd like you to do a little bit differently. 
let's show the three hydrogens that are on the nitrogen separate. Show those bonds separated from each other. Here's the glycine, it's simplest of all. And then what I'd like you to do is to just highlight what we're about to detach. Take the oxygen, and let's make this yellow. Take the oxygen from the N-terminal amino acid and highlight two of the three hydrogens on the nitrogen, the amine group. And this right here is going to represent, and I'll just kind of circle this part, this is going to be the dehydration process, which means removal of water. Now the reason I liked to draw those nitrogen and three hydrogens separate is I can see that one of those three hydrogens will be left when I create the peptide bond. So this is what I'd like where it says step two. This is what we drew together in that box. Now let's take a peek at what we're going to do in terms of final answer. Get rid of the water and show the new amide bond forming. So we have the N-terminal amino acid, which was our valine. Notice it's written first. And we have the C-terminal amino acid. That was the glycine. Know that it's written last. And the peptide bond, I'll highlight in yellow, also known as the amide bond. We removed a water molecule to form the peptide bond. The three-letter coding, V-A-L, hooked together to, and this says peptide bond there, G-L-Y. We just drew a dipeptide from the two amino acids, the N-terminal valine, hooked to the C-terminal glycine. Now you try one. This is where I'm going to ask you to just draw the final product just the final product. You don't need to do through all those steps. So draw together, whoops, I need a pen, the final product only. Now please pause, give yourself time to draw. First of all, I know you've got to go into your chart and find ALA's R group. I know you need to go to your chart and find GLN R group. Remember on test day, The name and structure will be given but no coding, which means you've got to memorize what the codes are for each of these amino acids. Now many, many, most if not all, except here, make you memorize those R groups. So I am being lenient knowing that uh, there isn't, a, a, you know, it's only so much you can memorize, but I can certainly anticipate you being able to give yourself time to memorize three letter codes for each of these amino acids. All right, go to work, draw this and come back when ready. Okay, let's take a peek. What have you accomplished? Well, when you went to your chart, and again, just memorizing, ALA, you found to be aniline, and that is a methyl group over here. Those, there's your aniline with a CH3 for its functional group. And of course, glycine, we've kept repeating, is one of the simplest because it's just got the hydrogen in it. So the glycine, of course, is just R group equal to, I'm trying to screw it up, there it is, there's your glycine. So that's how I know what I'm drawing. Oh, I did that wrong. Let me, I'm sorry, I did glycine, but it was GLN, so I grabbed the wrong one. GLN. So here, I accidentally highlighted glycine, but we needed, whoops, Linda, that's too far. In our amino acid chart, patience, patience, I'm trying to drag it up there. Here it is. So there's GLN, and that's the functional group we had to draw. So I just wanted to clarify I had spoken wrong, and but I drew correctly. So GLN gave me the functional group 
uh, of a CH2 combined to a CH2, CO, NH2. So there's the functional group for GLN. And then aniline here is CH3. Glutamine and alanine. Now, when I think about joining these together, remember, I take the O negative from the N-terminal amino acid, and I'm going to take two of the three hydrogens on the amine of the C-terminal amino acid, and we simply form the amide bond between the two. And of course, we removed water to do so. So the N-terminal, the nitrogen group stays positive. Here is the functional group for the amino acid known as alanine, ALA. And notice that the COO negative is now just the site of attachment to the next amino acid. It still has its nitrogen with one hydrogen on it. Here's the chiral center attached to its functional group. And then of course at this C terminal end, you have the COO negative. Notice that it's still considered to be a Zwitter ion because it is still charged equally. The NH3 plus is being neutralized by the COO negative for a net charge of zero. It's a Zwitter ion. How did you do? Oh, that's not too tough. Now, in the next section, we're really going to practice identifying amino acids and see what we can do here. So, identify the amino acid in this tripeptide bond. So, here is three units of amino acid. Perhaps the easiest thing to do to separate them is to find the carbonyl and nitrogen. That's the amide bond that's connecting one amino acid to the next. So if I highlight the first functional group, I'll highlight it in pink. The next functional group, I'll highlight in yellow. And in the next functional group, I can highlight in, how about a light blue? Those are going to give me the R groups. So name the tripeptide using three letter abbreviations. You want to go into your amino acid chart and find the R groups. That will help you with the name. Once you have the name, you'll need to have memorized those three letter codes to write the tripeptide's abbreviation. Give yourself think time. Come back when you're ready to check. Well, you're back, so you must be ready to check. Did you find in your first R group that that represented the amino acid known as leucine? Your next amino acid's functional group was that of alanine. And the third amino acid was the functional group from tyrosine. There are 20 amino acids for you to be practicing which tells us the three-letter code for the N-terminal amino acid is always written first. So the N-terminal has its functional group still charged, NH3+. Here is the C-terminal amino acid, and I know that because it has its functional group still charged, COO negative. So LEU, for leucine, ALA for alanine, and tyrosine is abbreviated TYR. And when you put these hyphens in, those are representing the amide bonds. Amide bonds in protein chains are called peptide bonds. There were two peptide bonds because this was a tripeptide, three amino acids joined together. I have to tell you, I don't think you can practice this enough. You have to really go to work and challenge yourself to remember those three letter codes. This is the skill level for the quiz and the test and the exam, anything like that. You'll see structures like this and tell me the code, or 
I could give you those three letter codes and you have to draw the structure of those peptides. So give yourself some think time and try some more. What I'm asking you to do is to write out the three letter codes and that's really what you'll be asked to do. Three letter codes are much more common than the one letter codes. The three letter codes to the amino acids. Go to work, come back when ready. Have you given yourself ample think time and are ready to check? Well, here's what I've discovered as I did this problem. I have a first R group is a CH3. I know that that functional group corresponds to alanine, and I'm learning that its three-letter code is ALA. In the next functional group I had matched for isoleucine. Now remember, isoleucine is I-L-E for its three-letter code. It's just that when you type it, it looks funny, I-L-E. So the three-letter code for this dipeptide is A-L-A, I-L-E, alanine, and isoleucine. Just to remind yourself, the N-terminal still has its charged functional group, and the C-terminal still has its charged functional group. So remember, when we draw these, we're still representing Zwitter ions. And letter B, in the first functional group, the functional group highlighted in green represented the amino acid tyrosine. And what I'll highlight in blue here is the functional group for the second amino acid known as valine. So this had a T-Y-R-V-A-L, three letter code, to name this dipeptide. And I can take a, oh, how about a nice yellow highlighter and represent the peptide bonds in each of these dipeptides. All right, so again, challenge yourself to really focus on the three letter code so you're able to draw or pick out the three letters when given the structure. You have some assigned reading at this point on neuropeptides and cephalins and pain relief. You actually have a series of readings to do. Um, section five, focus on the human body. Section A will be on neuropeptides. And then you come back and do some peptide hormones such as oxytocin and vasopressin. And then I'm going to pick up here in the notes at section 21.6 where it says proteins and the structures of proteins. So you're going to hop over a little bit of your notes right now and go back when you're ready with your book. But let's go on together in this second lesson. And I'm just going to share a little bit about the structures of proteins, starting with primary. We'll talk about secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures as the molecules get bigger and bigger. So the first, let's write down, is the primary structure of proteins. The primary structure of a protein is just the sequence of the amino acids. So when I've been writing with you the three letter sequences, L, E, U, A, L, A, V, A, L, I'm giving you a primary structure of a protein. These are the letters, if you will, building the words of the protein. The order of the amino acids. That is what we refer to by the primary structure. So when I think about this structure, and we've been drawing these, we might be inclined to think that these amide bonds in a uh, polypeptide, they've been drawing them linear, but that's not really the way they look. I want us to emphasize this picture in our mind, that we have a trigonal planar molecular geometry. Let's write that in our notes. We have a 120 degree bond angle because we have a trigonal planar molecular geometry. So instead of really how we've been drawing them as straight lines going from left to right, that's not really how they look. 
because this is a bond that is angled at 120 degrees. So do you see how it really goes up, down, up, down like a zigzag? It's zigzagged when we really look at the ball and stick model or uh, in terms of the true shape of the molecule, just like a hydrocarbon chain, we're often tempted to just draw that straight across, but we understand molecular geometry. It's not really the way molecules look. It has a zigzag 120 degree bond angle to it. So all bond angles are 120 degrees, giving the protein a zigzag arrangement with a trigonal planar molecular geometry. So a primary structure, you're just telling me the sequence, the order of the letters in the word, the order of the amino acids in the protein, giving me the primary structure. Now, as these proteins begin to grow in length, we have a secondary structure, which is more of a three-dimensional arrangement of localized regions within the protein. These regions arise due to the intermolecular attractions, typically because of hydrogen bonding between the amine group of one amide and the carbonyl group of the other. So you see how we can meet the criteria of hydrogen bonding. The nitrogen, who has a hydrogen attached to it, and the carbonyl of the next door, you know, these are the two functional groups, I have this very strong attraction between the oxygen on the carbonyl and the hydrogen from the amine. This is where you'll see hydrogen bonding occur, and it's very, very strong intermolecular attraction. The two main shapes, the most stable arrangements of a secondary structure is known as the alpha helix and a beta pleated shade, <laughs> pleated sheet, I said it wrong. Alpha and beta. Now you might have heard of an alpha helix before if you've studied in biology class, the structure of DNA and RNA molecules, alpha helix and beta pleated shades. These proteins are very commonly um, in an alpha helix or beta pleated sheet and sometimes even you have a random arrangement if molecules get very large. Here's a picture of an alpha helix. Do you notice how it just reminds you of a ribbon that's kind of encircling as you go up and around in the molecule? It's kind of a ribbon shape, isn't it? And if the molecule is having a right-hand spin or a left-hand spin, you can say that it has a right or left-handed shape. So this guy, as it's spinning down here, is creating this ribbon shape. And what's holding these, uh, it, you know, the twists are held in place by hydrogen bonds. So you can see here's the oxygen and the nitrogen. So here's the NH group, here's the C double bond O group, and you're seeing a very strong attraction between the hydrogen on the amine and the oxygen from the acid part. A very strong intermolecular attraction that holds the ribbon twists in place. Here's a picture of beta pleated sheets. As I think about this, we mentioned that amino acids, you know, as you form these long chains, they go up and down in zigzag motion. And so if I just have a, a series of polypeptides being held together in that zigzag shape from one sheet to the next by hydrogen bonds, this whole entire structure is being held together one string to the next string to the next to the next, all by these intermolecular attractions known as hydrogen bonds. So you can see them form kind of these ribbons, which is an alpha helix, or you can see them form sheets called beta pleated sheets. They're pleated just like a pleated shade because the, the string of molecules is zigzag. See how they're going up, down, up, down? That creates a pleated sheet. So these secondary structures are often drawn, 
with a shorthand because that's a pretty complex molecule to keep drawing. Such large macromolecules are often given shapes instead. And so you can see this alpha helix to me looks more like a ribbon and a beta pleated sheet. You're going to see just long sheets kind of strung out next together and then just a random region that has no organization at all. Those are known as secondary structures. Just put it into perspective. This is a strand of a spider web. You know, a single strand of silk, such from a spider web, which is made of proteins, isn't it? And the proteins you can see have organization to them. Now the organization, as you see here, those are your beta pleated sheets. Those are just lines of molecules creating a sheet-like appearance held together by hydrogen bonding. You also see these ribbons. Those are known as the alpha helix, also being held, you know, the ribbon itself is being held together by these hydrogen bonds holding the twirls or the swirls in place. And of course we have some random region as well. And those random regions are just that. They're not organized into an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. There is a tertiary structure in the three-dimensional shape, which is adopted by the entire peptide chain. So we did sequencing of amino acids as primary. The secondary shape, a little bit bigger structure, alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. And now getting even bigger, stand back and look at the entire peptide chain. These are adopted by the entire chain and they maximize hydrogen bonding and that helps them stay water soluble. Remember likes dissolve likes. And when likes dissolve likes, water with the hydrogen bonding available in amino acids helps to create a solubility. And then any nonpolar chain, if the R group of an amino acid happens to be nonpolar, what you tend to do is see that amino acid tuck it to the interior of the molecule and help stabilize it by London dispersion forces. So you can see polar functional groups will have hydrogen bonding. Nonpolar functional groups will have London dispersion forces. And of course, the amino acids with charged side chains, those charged side chains could be COO negative or NH3 plus. You'll have electrostatic interactions. And that just tells us that opposite charges interact with one another, creating electrically balanced compounds. And another type of interaction are known as disulfide bonds, especially in your hair molecules and structures similar to that. Disulfide bonds are covalent bonds. These are not intramolecular attractions, but true bonds instead. a true covalent bond between sulfurs forming a stabilization of a tertiary structure. So let me show you what that might look like. A disulfide bond. Now remember, this would be an R chain that contains sulfur. If we have R chains that contain sulfur, we can form two different types of actual bonds. We can form it intramolecular, which means it's within the same molecule. And this is the bond right here, a disulfide bond between two sulfurs, or you could have it between two different molecules known as intermolecular disulfide bonds. And so, there I missed a letter. So here is an amino acid chain. Here is an amino acid chain. One functional group on this chain has a sulfur. Here's a functional group on the opposite side chain, and they're going to form a bond called a disulfide bond. And so now these two strands are being held together 
by a disulfide bond. So it's just another type of covalent bond and interaction that provides stability to the tertiary shapes of proteins. Here's a larger look at it as well. Tertiary and quaternary structures kind of in a visual. Look at the long ribbon. You have a nitrogen terminal and here's the carbon terminal amino acid. You see that written? Here's the N terminal up here, NH3 plus. And down here would be the C terminal amino acid. And it should have COO negative. And so all of these represent long chains of amino acids and it's in a ribbon, isn't it? And that ribbon is being held together in structure by intermolecular attractions such as hydrogen bonds, intermolecular attractions that are nonpolar in regions such as London dispersion. Here we have an NH3 plus and a COO negative, part of side chains for amino acids. So that would be electrostatic attraction where opposites attract. And notice here two functional groups on two different amino acids coming together and they form a disulfide bond. Another example of a stabilizing force in this structure. Here I can see the ribbon here that is going to be called an alpha helix, a helical structure. Notice there's all types of opportunities to help stabilize the large structures of proteins. If we have nonpolar to nonpolar interactions, we would see London dispersion force. If we have charged areas between side change, electrostatic attractions occur. If we happen to have sulfurs attracting to each other, they'll form a bond known as a disulfide bond. And you know, just a large opportunity to set up intermolecular attractions between side groups as the proteins begin to fold into these larger substances. We talked about primary, secondary and tertiary, and an even larger note, the final structure would be called a quaternary structure. And what you see here, it's just adopted by two or more folding polypeptide chains coming together in a big globular substance. For example, you know, insulin is the type of protein we mentioned at the start of our chapter. It has two separate polypeptide chains linked together by disulfide bonds. So here is chain A, here is chain B, and you'll talk about the sequence of insulin. Notice the sequence just gives us these three letter codes. These would be those ribbons that we saw on the previous page. Once in a while, they'll have amino acids that have a side chain with the sulfurs lining up to form a disulfide bond, and that's between pages, or between these ribbons, Sometimes they'll have them form within the same ribbon, or sometimes they're formed to help stabilize and control the ribbons together. So this is intermolecular, and this is intramolecular, within the same molecule or between two different molecules. And these large structures just begin to get bigger and bigger and bigger, don't they? So you can see a primary, Primary structure we said is the amino acid sequence. The three letter codes that the letters matter, the sequence, because we're creating proteins based on the arrangement of those letters. The secondary structure we focused on alpha and beta. Alpha helixes, which are twirled ribbons, and beta pleated sheets, which are large flat arrangements. From there, we grew into tertiary structure, which is that three-dimensional of a polypeptide chain. And then the entire globular feature of a protein would be its quaternary structure, very complex polypeptide chains. Take a look at some of this in your reading. As you focus on the human body, you're going to look at some common proteins as you study those in from your reading. What are five to six most important points on common proteins? And when you come back, we'll be ready to talk a little bit about denaturation of proteins. All right, a good work today. We've had enough for one lesson. Take a little break, come back when ready.